Professor Arshong, um, why don't you go ahead and get us started and let's get these people motivated with your energy. Okay, so we have about 45 minutes and I want to talk... Um, who here knows me or has met me before or anybody a few people who here is like who, who are you and what's this all about? Okay, a few people who here is suspicious like is this even gonna be worth my time? I in the back no doubt no doubt that's why they stay in there they can be close to the door They don't even have to walk in front of the camera. They're just gonna disappear So we're gonna try to maximize our utility here um, for those of you who don't know me I'm not really comfortable talking a lot. I'm the kind of person who gives a few pithy statements and then will allow the others to speak. However, as I've been asked to be here in a professorial context, I might say a few extra words and then still enable you guys to speak. I really hope that what I share with you will be useful and helpful, but it will only be guaranteed to be so if you ask me things and be like, yo, but what about this? Or how about that? Now, I've been thinking about doing some stuff on my laptop, but um, I actually think that it would be better to just share some ideas with you. So I've been asked to talk about the foundations of business success. And I'm going to do that by giving you a little bit of background on myself and then I'm going to talk to you about failures. He asked to talk about the foundations of business success. And if I was from one of the good entrepreneurial magazines, I'd come here and talk to you about raising capital and building a strong team and getting the market, all of these wonderful things. But because I'm a contrarian, I did for Africa, I have my own way of seeing the world. I will talk to you about how not to fail from personal experience. So let's start with the basics. My name is Derek Nana Kwesi Abaka Ashang. People call me DNA because those initials sound better than Dinka. Derek Nana Kwesi Abaka Ashang. Dinka. I was born in Ghana, West Africa, raised in Brooklyn, New York, and in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Every four years, I moved to a new country till I was 20. I'm what you call an Afropolitan. I started my very first entrepreneurial endeavor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the age of six, where I had this wonderful idea. I was talking to a group of uh, high school entrepreneurs about this a couple of days ago. I had this wonderful idea that, yo, people come into the building where we live at and a lot of times they got grocery bags or they got little kids or a stroller or problems, issues. And it makes it hard to open the door when your hands are full. So me and my friend, we're going to stand here. We're going to open the door for people with their hands full. And we're going to charge a quarter. And this was my first lesson in the importance of understanding the principle of supply and demand. We were supplying a service, one nobody demanded. <laughs> Everybody go through the door. Nobody would pay the quarter. And we didn't really have the muscle to prevent them from getting through the door before they hit paid. So collections was a problem. I'm just saying, that was my first failure as an entrepreneur. Made zero money, built a little bit of muscle, but I learned. I went on further. I graduated from college. I had this incredible idea. I was a professional musician, I still am. And I was like, yo, there's this problem whenever we're doing like college gigs that we will want to do something with the venue. The venue will want to do something with us. But every year there's this turnaround where the kids that do the booking leave and some other kids come in and they don't know nothing. So all the time, the gigs you booking in the fall, it's like, okay, provided that it's the springtime crowd that's hooking it up. But when you're getting ready to book your gigs for the next spring, it's like the new kid and then the freshman is there and the sophomore who's just ready and full of ideas. We're going to make this happen. And all of the basic infrastructural stuff, the simple logistics of what we do, gets screwed up again. We were like, yo, what if we built a portal that basically systematized all the elements that are needed for booking a gig and it enabled the kid to come in and follow a simple checklist. 
And that would make it easier to get these gigs done. And it would save them time and energy, save us headache. And it would also be so useful that artists and agencies and producers could all use it. And we'll just take a little piece of each transaction. Great idea. Great business. We love it. Launched it in January of 2000. I put $10,000 of my own money in it. People will always tell you, don't put your own money into these things. Most of you is going to wind up putting your own money into these things. If you come to me and be like, D, I want you to invest in my thing, I'm like, how much have you invested? Oh, well, my time and my energy. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. What about cash? Because if you want my time and energy, okay, we can talk about that too. It's pricey. You want money too, that's expensive as well. So where are you at? Right? Sometimes you got to answer the phone in the middle of the talk. It's important. So we started this business in January of 2000. March of 2000, slight hiccup happened in the stock market. And uh, we had already identified the investors. We knew who was going to be down with us. We had a law firm. We had all this and that. And yay, 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 yay. Within six months, our investors went out of business before we did. At the end of the year, because when it happened, everyone was like, oh, it's a correction. But it's just a simple correction. They didn't think it was a crash. By the end of 2000, it was very, very clear. In 2001, we went out of business. That was my next company that failed. And I learned the importance of timing. Timing and understanding the market forces that are at play around you and how that might impact what you do and the potential for success or lack thereof. I then went on to do a number of different things, and I'll come back. This won't be a totally sad story. But I'll start with the bad stuff, just to set the stage. I started a couple of different things thereafter. One thing that I wound up doing was, like many of my friends, retreating to graduate school. Because by the time it got to 2001 and everyone was like, yo, there ain't no money in the system, what are we going to do? We all thought we were smart. Everybody went back to business school. And I was like, if I go to B school, I'm going to have to come out and get a corporate job in order to pay back my B school loans. I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. I went to Harvard as an immigrant, a foreign student. My family was living here, but I didn't have my papers like that. So I won scholarships that could not give me money. It was like, we'll give you a certificate saying you're smart. I'm like, I already knew that. I want you to give me a certificate saying that my, my tuition is paid. How about that? They're like, no can do. Why don't you ask the Ghanaian government? And they just laughed. Huh. No. So first educational experience came out with mad debt. I was like, I'm not going back to grad school until I get my citizenship. Got my citizenship. I was like, OK, now I can do this. I'm ready to apply to Harvard Business School. I look at the price. I'm like, oh. Maybe I should go to the law school. Look at the price. Ooh. It's not looking so good for this high education. <laughs> I'm serious. I was like, well, what do you do for a living? I play gigs, you know what I'm saying? I'm a musician, guitarist, bass. I write songs. I'm an entrepreneur. I've got great ideas. I implement them. None of which guarantees money. Right. So I talked to one of my mentors, who was at the Berkeley School of Music. He was like, yo, why don't you get a PhD? I was like, a PhD what? <laughs> He's like, a PhD? I was like, that's hard. He's like, yeah, but they'll pay you to study music. I was like, stop lying. <laughs> he was like, they will give you money to study music. I was like, show me who would do that. He was like, any program that's called ethnomusicology. Who here knows what ethnomusicology is? One, two. What's ethnomusicology? It's a study of music from different cultures. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's good. How do you want to put it? Same. Same. She's like, I agree. I'm with it. That's exactly correct. The way I would frame it is ethnomusicology is the study of the place and the role of music in society. So it's music from different cultures. But it's not just the music, it's not just the melody and the harmony and the rhythm and these things. It's the entire context in which this music exists. And what does it mean? What does it signify? Right? Music is a cultural form, poetry in motion. That's what we're there to study as ethnomusicologists.
Now, this was the stuff I was doing anyway. I was like, yo, man, I, I rock the party. You know, I, I bring the culture to the people. I could do this. So I looked at these programs. I checked out a few different options, and I applied to graduate school. Got in to graduate school. Got back into Harvard in a PhD program in ethnomusicology and Afro-American studies. Joint, first student in the history of the university to do both. Now, here comes the next failure. I applied for a series of fellowships to cover my expenses because I knew, hey man, I just got my, my papers done. So now I can delve into the bountiful wonders of this meritocratic system and get funding for my education. And lo and behold, I did. I got a full ride from Harvard. We're gonna pay your tuition. We're going to cover X, Y, Z, P, and Q. We're going to give you a stipend money on top. You're going to get paid to learn. Fantastic. But I wasn't satisfied. See, while I had applied to them, I had also hedged my bets and applied for a fellowship from the Paul and Daisy Soros Foundation. Won that. They're like, yo, we'll put in some money on your tuition, and we're going to put in a little extra something something on top for your living expenses so you can be comfortable and really focus on your intellectual pursuits. I was like, fantastic. I love America. Thank God I got my papers right. <laughs> I ain't get to the bad part yet. So I go to Harvard and I'm like, I accept. I will come to your PhD program, and not only that, but I am bringing a prestigious Soros Fellowship with me. More money and opportunity and prestige for the university. The university was like, okay, let's look at this package. Now, I have signed the paper saying I'm coming, because I was like, this is where I want to be at. I don't have to move. I already live in Cambridge. It's my alma mater. I know the professors. I love this place. They got mad props. You tell people, you went to Harvard? They stop paying attention. They'll tell them, look, if you go to somebody like, yo, where are you from? Yo, Charlie, I did for Adabraka. Do you know? The streets of Accra. Hey, the streets of who? I'm from Ghana. Ghana, West Africa. Ghana, you from Guyana? Oh my God, isn't there where they had that thing with the, with the Kool-Aid? Oh, ah, that's what you people know. I did for Ghana, West Africa. Africa, oh my God. Oh my God. Well, that's so wonderful. Is that where your shark teeth come from? <laughs> Yo, these are not shark teeth. I'm gonna just tell you that right now. So it's like, oh my God, I gotta explain to these people. I'm from Africa, I don't live in a tree. We got cars, we got vehicles, we do all kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Half of us work at Goldman Sachs up in this piece. What do you want from me? <laughs> you know, you get mad questions. And then what's the other thing? Okay, well, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Flatbush. Oh. Oh, you're from Brooklyn. Ah, oh, Brooklyn. Now they presume I have an attitude. And that's messed up, because I do. <laughs> I do, but I didn't need them to know yet. So all those things create some difficulties. Don't let me go further. Well, I mean, well, where'd you go to like, you know, your formative years, like, you know, your junior high, high school, middle school, whatever, like, oh, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. <gasps> Saudi Arabia, Allah Akbar. <laughs> now you got other issues in the modern era. Oh, you grew up there? Uh, well, are you Muslim? I'm like, well, should it matter? All these things working against you, except for one. So where did you go to college? I went to Harvard. <laughs> Ooh, starting to smell like a Cinnabon. <laughs> Starting to look a little bit good. We just noted you got a tight, tight waist, <laughs> strong calves. He's like a supermodel now. I was looking like Barney a minute ago. And by that, I mean the purple dinosaur. So the Harvard thing works. So I'm like, yo, I got in. They gave me money. I'm going to sign on the paper. Lo and behold, a few weeks later, I got this other money. I'm like, here you go. I'm going to bring this other cash to the table. Harvard is like, oh, well, Derek, congratulations. We're really proud of you. 
we're so looking forward to having you come back to the university. We know you did well as an undergrad. Your senior thesis, summa cum laude, won a Hoops Prize highest award we give for undergraduate work at Harvard University. We know you're right. Show enough. About this year, scholarship. You won this, and we're super proud. It's fantastic. But the reality is, you're making a lower middle class salary to be in grad school. You're making way too much money to be in grad school. I'm like, what do you mean I'm making way too much money? This is America. Y'all got way too much money in your endowment. Why are you charging this for grad school? Anyway, <laughs> I'm just talking about way too much money. They're like, you just have too much money, you know? We're going to rescind part of your scholarship. I was like, but you looked at my test scores. They were like high, right? Like, oh yeah, 90, 95th, 99th percentile. OK. You got my transcript from undergrad, right? Yeah, yeah, that's summa cum laude. That was dope, eh? OK, you, you've seen the work that I've done like in my professional career. Like, shh, yeah. You, work, you did that thing with Spielberg, right? I'm like, yes. But yeah, we don't have nobody else here that's worked with Spielberg. That's beast, kid. We like it. We might put that in the brochure. <laughs> I'm like, but what about the money? I got my citizenship so I could come back and not have to pay. They were like, yeah, bro, we feel you. And it's not like you're going to have to pay. It's just that you have too much money. Young kid from Africa, born in a house with no running water. I've had malaria four times in my life. And I'm sitting here before you. Harvard University told me I had too much money. So they took some away. And that taught me the importance of leverage. Once I had signed the agreement that I was coming, financial aid was no longer negotiable. I didn't see the fine print that they could change my award. And apparently, in a meritocracy, the poor kid was too smart to deserve all that money. Never mind the 100000 I still owed them for my undergraduate degree. So I went to Harvard. It didn't quite have the same shine as it did the first time around. It didn't smell like a Cinnabon to me. Had an interesting time in grad school. Learned a lot. Did some avant-garde things. I actually started looking at how does, uh, you know, basically my, my area of interest was how music influences youth identity. How a generation sees itself. You know, to me, music is more than just sounds or just what's bumping in the background and when you're trying to mack a girl at the club. No. Music is soul. It's spirit. He knows what I'm talking about. It's something that moves you. It's something that speaks to you. It's human communication taken to the highest level. I would say that for all forms of art. But music is special. Imagine we were watching a film on the screen. And I was sitting here like this. How much am I going to enjoy the film? Eh, not so much, because I can't see it. What if we went to see the Mona Lisa? And you closed your eyes. What would the experience be like? What if you went to a poetry slam and somebody's up there spitting the mad science and the flavor and you know because this is how it is when we at a show. We just make our lyrics flow. And meanwhile, you still trying to mack that one girl, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it would just be really cool to get to know you a little better. How much are you going to really experience that artistry? But if someone were to walk by with a boombox just passing through, playing some Bob Marley. That's going to impact the feeling in this room. Don't worry about a thing. Right? Now, let's say they walk by playing some Metallica. A whole other thing. Or some Guns N' Roses. Welcome to the jungle. We are what you need. Or maybe it was some Vivaldi. I ain't going to even sing the Vivaldi. <laughs> I, for that. I know, right? Right? Maybe it was, it was Mozart. Dum, 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 dum. 
But basically, whatever is happening musically, even if you all were fully invested in what's going down here at the front of the room, that music is going to shift and color the entire sentiment in this space. I guarantee it. There's something funny about music. It gets in you. You can't go over it. You can't get under it. It is the only artistic form that can operate on a human being in a passive context. You don't even have to pay attention, and it will color your soul. So I wanted to know how music influences youth identity, who we are, what we're about, who we want to be, how we see our place in this world. I was particularly interested in it because of what I saw happening in hip hop which I grew up with as a revolutionary art form, something that helped us speak truth to power, that came up from the streets of kids like me who didn't have much and took what they did have and they made art out of it, art that shook the world, that defined the very nature of pop culture across the globe for the last 40 years. I wanted to know how our unique expression had come to be solely defined by how much destruction we could visit upon our communities, how deeply we could disrespect the women in our lives, how violent we could appear to be against those who had no recourse, how hip hop had come to be defined by how deeply we could degrade ourselves and our community, how often we could spit upon the weakest among us and not say a damn thing to the powerful. I wanted to know how the revolution had been co-opted. So I said, I'm going to study how music influences youth identity. And part of what I'm going to study is how music reaches us in the first place. What are the factors that determine this? And in order to do that, I need to look at some broader issues. Therefore, I am going to create a corollary. I'm like, what's the big problem that music companies face? High cost of production, distribution, and promotion. Technology makes it cheap to produce and distribute more expensive than ever to promote. Interesting. Who has found some really intriguing ways to leverage the power of the mass to do smart stuff? Ooh, technologists are all over that. This is pre-crowdfunding, et cetera. No Kickstarter at this time. It's 2002, 2003. But I was like, wow, what about the open source trend? It's been around for almost 20 years at that point. What if I look at how trends in open source software map onto ideas of open source content? And if you can look at that, specifically how you can open source these ideas around music, then you could create multilateral flows of content between societies. And that can be a method of actually undermining some of these hegemonic concepts that are coming from the West to the rest of the world and have little kids in Ghana run around calling each other nigger. Wearing puffy coats. It's 90 degrees in the shade, dog. <laughs> I just need a single fat goose, maybe a skinny goose. The triple fat ain't working in West Africa. How is it that this incredible art form that has drawn us together across diasporic lines has now been defined so narrowly and that narrow and typically negative definition has now been propagated around the world? This is who we are today. So I literally wrote a treatise, a manifesto, around how you could apply open source principles that apply to software development, how you could apply them to music promotion. I worked on this for years. I then went and spoke about it at conferences in multiple countries. My professor had been on a sabbatical. She came back home and she was like, Derek, I heard that you hadn't done this and this and this. I was like, well, I had been working on it. He's like, well, what exactly is going on? See, Harvard did not have a program in jazz theory and I had to do music theory, but because I was dealing with music of the African diaspora, it didn't make sense for me to do classical Western music theory. They said I should do jazz theory, 
Harvard had nothing. So I had to go take classes at New England Conservatory on my own. So I went to do the classes, and it was all great. But then I got invited to go on a research trip to Ghana during the time that Harvard is on vacation. And EC was not on vacation. So the question was, well, should I stay or should I go? What you think I did? I went. I went with no hesitation. And I came back with all the data points I needed for my research. Everything is great. I wrote up the entire theorem. It was fantastic. She came back and she was like, yo, I see that you didn't get the best grade in this class. I was like, well, I got an A in everything else. I got a B in that because they didn't count the homework that I sent while I was away. They're like, what do you mean? I was like, I did all the work, but they said that I needed to be there. That doesn't apply to the Harvard co colleges. It's like, yeah, but NEC has different rules. I'm like, yeah, but I didn't know that. And they didn't tell me when I was leaving, and I messed up. I'm sorry. Yo, I sat there. I thought she was going to kick me out of her office. She was so mad. She was so livid. We brought you here. We've invested this money. You're supposed to do this and this and this. And you're coming here with this wild theory. You should be in a village with a tape recorder. She didn't say it like that. I ain't going to put that on her. But that was the general sentiment I took from it. I might have been a little sensitive that day. And she was so mad. Like, why didn't I finish this theory class? And I was like, I did the work. No, it's wrong. I'm like, okay, I messed up. All right, maybe I made the wrong decision. Going out there, doing this research, coming back here with this crazy avant-garde idea. My professor thinks it's absolutely ridiculous that you would take this concept from software, which none of them is interested in, and literally say, this is how you could edit it and apply it to content because to me, software, music, video, it's all content, but I'm crazy, not thinking right. Um, got the founder of the Free Software Foundation, the guy who created the open source movement in technology, to actually edit the piece, and he loved it, and he thought it was really smart, but my professor hates it. Went and presented it at Harvard Law School, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. They thought it was absolutely genius. They introduced me to a bunch of different people who they wanted me to talk to about these ideas. Got invited to speak about it in Spain, in the UK, in Puerto Rico, in Ghana, in Indonesia, in Sweden. My professor hates it. And at the end of the thing, because now I'm on probation, they don't know if I get to stay or go. And this time is not my choice. She says to me, you know, it's funny though. I was in Bamako. And I heard this thing on the radio. And I was like, is that Derek Ashong? And I was like, I just told you that I wrote a theorem around open source content, how you could apply the ideas of open source production from software to ideas of open source promotion in music, and how that could help you create multilateral flows of content between societies, not having to come from a Western superstructure, but being able to bubble up from the underground. You are in Bamako, which is in Mali, a place I've never been. You hear me on radio, and you didn't ask why or how. And that's how I dropped out of grad school. Failures, failures, so many failures. I'll tell you at least one more. Oh, this is going to be sweet when I get to that. Y'all are going to be like, oh! and I won't literally drop the mic because I don't want to break anything because I know y'all put work into this. I want FIU trying to charge my brother over here. But there's a, mad, a method to the madness. Next failure, I go out doing my thing, working hard, out of grad school, working in business, consulting, doing my own thing as a band, musician, got myself airing in a couple of different cool places, got signed to a record deal, record label comes to release the album, didn't do very good. They start looking at me like, well, it didn't do good. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't do really good any promotion. You didn't really do nothing. They're like, well, I don't know. I think it's your fault. I was like, this is bullshit. I can't believe this. You're looking at me. You're looking at me? It's your job. I made the music. You should have to sell it. I was like, I want out of my record deal. 
Drama, 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 legal, legal, legal. Beef for years. I was banned from releasing certain of my own music in the United States for years off of a record deal. Interestingly enough, though, I had talent. I could tap and dance. Met another label, bankrolled by Universal, out of Berlin, but global distribution, signed me to a 360 deal. <laughs> but we were going to do a global tour, B. We're starting in the United States. Then we're going to go over to Ireland. Then we're going to hit up the UK. We're going to go to Sweden. I'm a single man. I am proud African, but I'm open-minded. I heard Sweden. <laughs> I was like, what? Hey, Dora. I was like, it's going to be dope. And we're going to bust down to South Africa. We got the dates in Japan. I'm down for Tokyo. I want you to know about Osaka. Start the tour. Everything is going Chris. We in the Midwest. We're supposed to be on the road for six months. Everybody has quit their job. I am no consulting clients. I used to consult for Visa, Nokia, MySpace, Interscope. Nah, nah, it's a rap. Playing my music. Everybody quit their job. Left their home. No apartment. We on the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. You see what I'm saying? Waiting on these tickets for Ireland. I'm like, yo, talking to the label head. Yo, what's good? You know, what's the ticket? Oh, yeah, the tickets is coming, coming, coming. Listen, we need you to do this thing and write this thing up. I was like, okay, I did all that. Stuff. Yeah, man, what's up with these tickets? Yo, we going this and blah, blah, blah. This month is going on. Now it's two weeks before we're supposed to fly out. And I'm like, brethren, where the hell are them tickets? Yo, man, well, this and this and this and this issue and da 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 And then now uh, it's not getting returns on my phone calls. Now, mind you, this is in the early part of 2009. Something economic had happened in 2008 that had shifted the positioning of a lot of businesses. Now, I knew a little something about timing at this point. And I was like, the record label doesn't have the money to underwrite the tour. I'm going to take my band over to Europe and be stuck. So having learned some lessons before, I call my lawyer, and for the second time, I canceled my record deal. I called up every single member of my band. I told them, I'm sorry, guys. I know we're supposed to be on for six months. I know this is what we're supposed to be doing. I know this is how much we've signed our contracts to get paid. And none of it is going to happen. We have enough money to fly everybody home. And that was it. And I had no home to go to. These are a series of failures. And it's like, you know, we're supposed to talk about the foundations of business success. I think this is the foundation. Yes, it is. This is the real talk. This is the stuff that they don't tell you when you be like, yeah, be an entrepreneur, start something. Just do it. Time and time again, things don't work out the way you think. Time and time and time again. Professor Anshan, um, just because I know two of the best storytellers I've met in South Florida are both from Africa. Uh, Babakar from Mocha and Derek. Um, I haven't heard you guys this quiet all day. Nobody move once they, you take over the room. Um, you just, every time I talk to you, I learn something new and it's just, it's inspiring. So, just because we're trying to catch up on some of the time, because otherwise I would just let you talk for a full hour. I just, I wouldn't eat. I would just sit here and listen to you. I got the clock talk. ticking here, so yeah, I'm I, watching. I, I know. <laughs> I'm just trying to get back some of the minutes from the traffic. No um, I wanted to ask you at least three questions. I don't even know if I'm going to let you guys open up the floor, because we'll be here forever. Um, I can see it all in your faces, all the questions. Uh, if I had an augmented reality, I would just see things popping up. Um, mm -hmm. Briefly. 
you have to at least explain to them of your music journey and how it led to take back the mic because they have to at least know the success Absolutely. of how this turned that how that whole foundation of everything you said turned into take back the mic Absolutely. Which I so, think now the name makes even more sense to me. Damn, Skippy. So, how did all this lead to where I am today? Well, a couple of interesting things. The fact that Harvard took part of my scholarship away meant that I did not feel tied to the university in the same way I had as an undergraduate. That's why when it came time for me to make a choice to go overseas or stay, I went overseas to do what I thought I had to do. That theorem that I wrote around how do you take these trends in open source mu uh, software and apply them to open source music was read by a number of different people, one of which was a very, very successful music producer by the name of Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics. Sold 200 million records, both of his own and for other people. He was like, what you doing right here is interesting and cool, but obviously you're not enjoying grad school. I was like, why do you say that? He's like, because I know you're going to Harvard, but every time I see you, it's in Brooklyn. <laughs> like, he's like, how you living in Brooklyn, go to school in Boston? <laughs> I was like, what you trying to say, dog? <laughs> Reading between the lines. I happened to be on a trip to LA that week, and I was supposed to be there for four days. I wound up staying for five years, never went home. Didn't just drop out of grad school. Dropped the mic in grad school. Leapt in with Dave, consulted for a number of large companies. That's how I got into consulting. Ran business development for his company. Had a number of successes there. Left and had some interesting things happen in my career. After that time when we had the loss of the record deal, I was recruited at the same time I've been talking very quietly to some people at a company called Harpo. So one year after the band lost the deal and I went homeless, knocking on my girlfriend's door like, could I crash with you for a week or two? I was debuting a new show called The Derek Ashong Experience on Oprah Radio. That was with, at the time, Oprah Radio was uh, Gail, Dr. Oz, Dr. Berman, Maya Angelou, Oprah, and me. Just a few. One of these things was not like the other. Opened up that show at Sundance, live on stage with the band, blew up the spot, got recruited by another TV network to say, well, could you do this sort of trans, you know, media thing that you did there? Because the Oprah thing was a radio show, but if you watch it online, it was a four camera video shoot. United Nations asked me if I could do something with them. So I did a project with them around youth and development, et cetera, with Tommy Hilfiger, uh, billionaire Ray Chambers, another billionaire, Ted Turner, Jeffrey Sachs, Queen Rania of Jordan, and uh, Bob Geldof. This is a couple cats. Did it, did it well, got hit up by another international network like, yo, could you take these concepts and make something that was bigger? That was for like television, but still interactive and targeting young audiences. I was like, yeah, I could do that. So we created a new platform, hosted it, built it. That show wound up in 300 million households worldwide. Young people talking about what was happening in their lives and directing what was news. Won an RTS Society Award, which is role of television society. Uh, the UK version of the Emmys beat the BBC and Sky to get that and won or got our uh, Emmy nomination, first ever for this network that was not distributed in the United States, uh, but our show was. Was then recruited by ABC and Univision to come here and help launch another network, which I did, and then left and took all of what I had learned. And I said, wow, media companies are making a fundamental mistake right now. Media companies are making a fundamental mistake right now. See, everybody thinks that when you're talking about content, you've got to be tied to the old school model, where I need a big infrastructure to dictate to you what counts, what's valuable. And I got to put a lot of money into creating that. And then I got to hope that it's viable, and I'm going to write off of most of the things that I create, but the few that work are going to be fantastic. And I said, nah, 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 that don't make no sense. What if you actually let people tell you what's hot, and you made what they said was hot? then you wouldn't have to spend so much money, you wouldn't have to waste hardly any of it, and you would make it happen. I'm gonna build a technology platform that rewards fans for discovering and sharing hot content. Specifically, one that enables them to build social currency and take it across multiple platforms. I went and I talked to mad heads, mad heads about this. Number of folks, investors, this and this and that. 
they were like, meh, meh, meh. It's not going to work. It's not smart. I remember talking to a senior executive at a major technology company who was like, yo, this is crazy. It's hard. It's going to be bananas. It's not going to work. You can't do this. And then I got invited to speak to another executive at a very senior tech company who was like, this is going to be crazy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be bananas. You've got to do this. Because if you do that, it's going to be hard to copy you. So I created this company called Ampit. I spent a while before I started the company talking to some of my people about what I was going to do. One of them happened to be one of the guys I met when I was telling my little story about open source software and content at Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School. They introduced me to this one brother who was really cool. He was a CTO of a, of a, of a, 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 a tech company in Silicon Valley. We became boys. We were just friends for eight, seven, eight years. Next thing you know, he sells a company to Facebook. He goes in there. If you recall, Facebook, when it went public, its stock started at the tank. This person actually went to Mark Zuckerberg and was like, I know how to fix it. You have a problem in mobile. Let me take it over and we'll make this happen. They were like, no way, you must be kidding. He was like, no, I'm not kidding. He took it over, made it happen, and Facebook is where it is today. That gentleman met with me at the offices of Facebook. He's like, D, this is the same as the theory you wrote about in grad school, but you're putting it into practice. I was like, yeah. He's like, okay, we need to talk about this. We start talking. A few more months, a few more months, a few more months. I quit my job, and I was like, yo, I'm going to do this. He was like, I want to write the first check. I was like, I didn't even pitch you for He's like, you don't worry about it. He's like, the hardest thing ever is asking your friends for money. I'm going to write you the first check. I had had an investor here in Florida say that they were going to write me the first check. And next thing you know, I did everything they said to do, and they didn't write the check. They did not write the check. Meanwhile, this guy did. See, one of the things that I had learned was always hedge your bets. That doesn't mean don't be committed to what you do, but don't put all your eggs in anybody else's basket. So we started Ampit. And because the first investor was a senior guy at Facebook, the, the senior tech exec he had me go talk to about what I was going to do and how I was going to do it was the head of global marketing for Facebook. And she was the one who said, yes, you have to do it. And this and this and this is why, even though it's going to be hard. So we launched this platform. We started an original series on it called Take Back the Mic, the World Cup of Hip Hop. We let kids in Brazil, Colombia, and Jamaica, not the typical crowd that your Palo Alto app company is trying to target. We went over to the poor kids in the ghettos and the favelas that nobody really trying to holler at. And we were like, what do you think is hot? They picked nine artists. Not from voting, but strictly engagement. We could just see what they're listening to and sharing. Those nine artists, we said, we're going to tell the story of your community through the eyes of those artists. And we did it. Low budget, guerrilla style. Everyone was like, this is going to be ridiculous. You're spending all your money. You should be spending it on technology development. Why are you doing it this show? Did the show. Those nine artists were incredible. Brought the winners here with the help of eMerge. They performed at this year's eMerge Gala. The top three, one from Brazil, one from Colombia, one from Jamaica. The winning band, we met them outside of a favela or in a favela outside of Rio. 60 days later, they're on the cover of the national newspaper. Now, I said, I'm solving the problem of production, distribution. No, promotion, promotion. I'm solving the issue of promotion. And I just took a band from the ghetto of the ghetto and I put them into a national spotlight. Go free. 20 million media impressions, zero marketing dollars spent. That series was then uh, nominated for an Emmy Award, which we lost to Taylor Swift. I feel like Beyonce. <laughs> Where's Kanye when you need him? I let it go. The entire premise of the company is built on every single one of the failures that I illustrated for you. If I had been a smarter kid, I would have gone to Harvard Business School and not gone to the grad school, and I would have had to pay the money back, and I would have been an a investment banker and not an entrepreneur. If I had been better at negotiating early in the game, I would have kept those Harvard scholarships, and I would have said, felt a tie to the university instead of being like, whatever, I'm out. Peace. I quit Harvard. What? Because you don't stand by me the way I thought you did. And I still love my alma mater, but not the same way. I gained my independence. If that record deal had worked out, I might still be on the road today playing, playing, playing instead of having the money to take care of my babies and start my company and I still play my music. And I'm helping other artists as well. Every single one of those failures gave me the opportunity to be where I am today. And y'all should know that we are moving to Los Angeles. We've just done a deal with a company backed by Steven Spielberg 
to co-finance the virtual reality components of what we do with the World Cup of Hip Hop in our second year. And we're now in dialogue with a legitimate Hollywood mogul to build a joint venture because they realize the value of the analytics that we develop through our technology and what we can do with that. Now, is the next step gonna be easy? I can tell you right now, it's looking hard. Is it gonna come quick? Everything takes longer than you think. Are we gonna give up? Never. Are we gonna slow down? Maybe a little, sometimes. Are we gonna make it? Yes. Why? Because the fundamental, fundamental root of success is the ability to iterate, to try, to learn, to refine, to try again, to learn, refine, try again, learn, refine, and try again. And if you do just that, you will be a success. Thank you. Lesson so learned. Much.